Uh, continuing on from uh, some previous discussions about uh, the rule of halves, as well as some introductory comments about irrigation and conservation, I, I did want to include this uh, statement from uh, President Hinckley, uh, previous president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who I have tremendous respect for. Uh, many, many years ago, he said, dear brothers and sisters, we encourage church members as good citizens to support local water conservation measures and to implement such initiatives in their homes and yards. We are in the process of implementing water saving practices for meeting houses and other church facilities. These collective efforts will continue, well, excuse me, will contribute significantly to the conservation of this most precious resource. So I, I, I like to just point this out that this isn't just some thing that Dr. Hopkins is interested in. This is something that we all should be interested in. Water scarcity is a, is a significant thing. So, so how do we actually do it now? We've, we've seen you know, some, some things that are pique our interest, but, but let's actually talk about how do we schedule irrigation? Well, it's, it's a little complicated because it depends on several things. It depends on the amount of water that can be held in the root zone. So we kind of need to understand that. The amount of available water currently in the root zone when the soil water supply needs to be replenished, which is the maximum allowable depletion, reviewed that in the rule of halves, the water application capacity of the irrigation system can also factor in here. Uh, now, now, root zone depth can change over the time. Uh, it, it's important to understand that. It's especially true for annual plants, but also for turf grass. Uh, for example, potato is shown on the next slide and is the plant example used throughout this presentation. Uh, because it's, it's an interesting one and I know a lot about it. So if you look at root depth uh, of this potato plant, um, you know, it starts off, uh, you know, pretty, pretty shallow and, you know, and it, it doesn't mature until about 90 days into the season. And so, so it's, it's rooting ability, or excuse me, it's capacity to take up water by the roots changes with time. Um, now, and turf grass has a seasonal fluctuation. Cool season grasses, for example, will have deeper roots in the spring and the fall and less in the summer. So it's important to kind of understand the architecture of these roots. So if you irrigate to the maximum depth the whole season, you have wasted so much water early on. If we'd been irrigating down to 20 inches uh, back in you know, May, then we're wasting water. Um, so we kind of start off by irrigating a little shallow and then we increase it over time. Uh, so that's important to realize. Um, and now, now just some review things here. We've seen this before, uh, kind of a different way to look at some of these things. We talk about uh, a soil being saturated with, when the pores are essentially full of, of water. Uh, after about 24 hours-ish, uh, it's going to be more like in a clay soil and less in a really sandy soil, but about 24 hours we lose the gravitational water and then we are at what we call field capacity, which is the water that the, the, the soil can hold against gravitational loss. And then we have, um, we continue that water use down to the point where it reaches this, this permanent wilting point, um, which is, you know, which is extremely dry. We, we don't want to go there. Uh, instead, uh, you know, we have this available water that it, and the plant available water lies between the field capacity and the permanent wilting point. That's the, that's the plant available water, not between saturation, even though, even though it's saturation, there's plant available water there, but that's just by definition, we call the plant available water between field capacity, permanent wilting point. Now, the thing is, is at about halfway done, we are beginning to see plant stress. So for most things, we want to avoid that. Now, in some cases we can get away with it. Some species are more tolerant to moisture stress than others. Turf grass actually is kind of good to get a little bit of stress, especially in the spring. Um, but some plants like potato, if I'm a potato farmer, I do not want to stress my potato plants because I will get potatoes with arms and legs that are not fun to peel. People don't like to buy those kind of potatoes and don't, you know, they still taste fine, but they're kind of ugly. So. Yeah, every plant's a little different, but we, we typically want to turn on the irrigation system uh, when about half of the plant available water is gone. Okay, so if we look at this and we kind of look at it by uh, uh, soil textures, we, we see that it's, it's, even though I told you this rule of halves things, it's not a perfect thing, right? You'll notice that in some cases it's more than half, um, but you know, essentially it's about half. 
but but it does vary. And, and the other thing is, is if we look at volumetric water content, which is what the way most sensors measure water is by volumetric soil water content. You can see it's a moving target depending on soil texture. You know, um, so you know with the sandy, pure sandy soil, I don't, you know, there's not much volumetric soil water content uh, at field capacity, and um, and and there's you know kind of a narrow window there. Um, yeah, the, the actually this this loam silt loam category here is where I get the most plant available water. Not a clay, interestingly enough. Most people think, well, it'd be clay would give us the most plant available water. But actually, those clay particles are so small, the micropores are so small that it tends to hold that water tightly. So it's a little more difficult for the plants to extract it. Anyway, bottom line is um, we have this plant available, plant unavailable water. Now, if we overlay the, the maximum allowable depletable water to this, the mad water, we call it, um, that mad water, I, that's, that's my irrigation. I wanna, I wanna use up that much. I don't wanna get into this yellow zone. I wanna stay up here. Uh, that's how I wanna irrigate. Okay, so uh, again, we have that, you know, the rule of halves, 50% of the pore space um, of the soil is, 50% uh, of the soil is pore space. About 50% of the pore space is occupied by water at field capacity. Uh, about 50% of the soil water at field capacity is plant available water. And about 50% of that is the mad water. Uh, again, it's not perfect, but that's, that's pretty good. So if I'm doing calculations, it's good to kind of know those. It gives me a starting point. So rules of thumb are good. Nice little reference points. So we can often use this to get close to that. But, but typically, I, I, I start there, but then I have to tweak it because it, it varies a little bit based on organic matter and, and uh, other things in the soil. So for example, potato is relatively more water sensitive and it's been determined experiment, experimentally that the MAD is only 35% instead of 50%. I can only deplete 35% of the water instead of 50%. So like turf grass, I can do 50%. Um, most species in the urban environment, I can do 50%. Um, potato uh, and then some other sensitive garden species, for example, I, I can't do that. I can't let them get that dry. So that, that's just one little example of, a, of an exception to the rule. Now, each irrigation zone, zone should be replenished only when the water should only replenish the water in the active root zone. Now, how do we figure that out? Well, if we're doing this calculation for potato, we're going to say, okay, 35% my mad water times the plant available water. And we're going to do that in inches per foot, for example, in, the, in, this, in this instance. And we're going to multiply it by the root zone depth. So uh, sandy soils, I got about 0.35 inches per foot uh, and, and uh, et cetera on down. And we, and we can look those values up and we'll show you that here in just a second. But, but that just shows you, you know, if, if I have a foot of, of soil, how much of it is, 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 mad, or is plant available water, okay? So if we look at the estimated mad water for a potato, so that's, that's the 35% the number, 35% of plant available. This is the kind of a table that I would get for a potato crop. And, it, and then this is also showing it, you know, varying by the season, early season, I've only got eight inches of roots, um, you know, that, you know, we're sitting here um, for the first 30 days, you can see how many inches of water I would have. And then as it gets, you know, deeper roots, we get more water. Uh, because they've got a, a bigger uh, bank account, basically. And so um, I, this is how much, so like, let's say I have a sandy loam soil and it's um, 120 days into the season. I've got about an inch of water of uh, mad water. And so if I'm losing uh, 0.25 inches per day, I'm going to have to water every four days uh, for this potato crop in order to make sure I don't cross into that stress zone. Um, so that's, you know, that's based on a, a 20 inch uh, root depth. It was a little deeper, shallower, etc. cetera. Um, so, so lots of variables there, but to be a really good irrigator, that's kind of what we have to do. Um, it, it's in some ways easier in farming because I'm dealing with, you know, kind of one, one species out there and, you know, out in the whole field. In the urban environment, it's more difficult because I'm dealing with multiple species. So I have to be a little more generic in, in how I water. Um, so when, when we look at um, the, 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 how this looks on a graph, um, using a sensor, for example, uh, we look at the net depletion of water. So what, what it is basically here is, is, is that I've got that plotted out uh, on this graph. And my goal is to stay above the line. 
And so you can see that, you know, the soil is getting dry and then we turn on the irrigation system and it, and it comes back up and, and we don't, uh, we've replenished the root zone and then we drop back down, got a little bit below the line, not good. And then we just keep doing that. And so you can see several instances, they got a little bit, a little bit dry here in this particular uh, case study with potato. Irrigation can't be scheduled, or excuse me, oh man, I'm having a tough time. It can be scheduled by soil water monitoring, or we can look at calculations using evapotranspiration, or what we call ET. With either strategy, the fields should be checked daily to ensure adequate moisture. We have to walk out there, especially with a crop. You know, if, if, I'm, if I'm growing a crop of, of apples or whatever, I, there's so much riding on that. There's a lot of dollars riding on it. I, I can't uh, not be careful. I really have to do that. We're, we're a little less careful in the urban environment. There's a little more forgiveness in the urban environment, but the concept is kind of still the same. And I think it's good to understand how we do it in a really intensive system, like in agriculture. And in some cases, we, we see that, um, uh, we see that we want to uh, be that accurate in some, some situations where I need to be a really good irrigator. All right, so if I'm gonna do soil monitor, soil water monitoring using a, a sensor, uh, there's all kinds of different types of sensors or even gravimetric measurements that we could make. Uh, these water potential measurements need to be converted to water content to determine the amount of irrigation needed. We wanna maintain at least 65% of the plant available water. In other words, we don't wanna lose more than the 0.35. Now this is for potato, again, now, if we were doing turf grass, it would switch to 50-50 there, okay? But we're, we're just continuing on with potato as our example. So we could do something like soil capacitance uh, measurements um, in this particular little sensor. It measures the dielectric constant and it estimates soil uh, water content, soil volumetric water content. Um, we get a, an output that kind of looks like this. Um, you can see soil water content over here on the y-axis. Um, you can also look at the irrigation amounts over here on the z-axis, and then we've got date along the uh, x-axis. So the irrigation amounts in millimeters are these arrows uh, along here. So for example, we irrigated right here. You can see that the, that the water bumped up. We've got, oh, I forgot to mention, we have two different depths. So this is, uh, this is soil moisture. I think that's orange. I'm colorblind. I forgot to ask somebody. So it's this one right here. Uh, that's, that's a soil sensor that's sitting uh, at 8 to 25 centimeters. And then I've got another one that is sitting between 23 and 41 centimeters. It's oriented this way. And so it's measuring the, the volumetric water content there. And it's this, this uh, yellow, it looks like to me. So what we can see is we come along here and we irrigate and it pops back up. The shallow one pops up a lot more. The deeper one, we, we're not really getting too much water down there. Uh, we're getting a little bit, especially like on this irrigation right here, um, we put more irrigation water on, uh, about 30 millimeters, and it actually got down into that second uh, foot uh, below 23 centimeters here. So anyway, that just, that's just kind of a, an example of what a, a, an output looks like if I'm using a, a soil moisture sensor. Here's another one where we're using four sensors, uh, a little bit different type of a, of a model. Uh, of a sensor here. Um, you know, we've got three here in the root zone. We've got one down deep trying to check and see, uh, we're, see if we're not uh, pushing water too deep. And, um, and you can kind of see this uh, output here. Again, we're getting, you know, this shallow one, it's getting drier, 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 drier. And then boom, we put, turn on the irrigation system. Uh, but it looks like we only put on enough water here to just fill this top little six inches or so, because there really wasn't a whole lot of water that we got down into that second foot. Um, there's lots of different things. Here's a tensiometer. These are used somewhat commonly in agriculture. Um, I kind of grew up with these. Um, they're not as common anymore. We have some more sophisticated ones, but we're gonna talk about those more in a later day. Um, with these, uh, we, we've learned that um, you know, what numbers, uh, you know, the, the, like these tensiometers here, they measure uh, the, the, the water tension, how much tension is on the water uh, in centibars. And so for minus 30 centibars in sandy soils, 
it means it's stressed, but you know, a little bit different numbers for other types of soils. But we've learned that. We've learned how to calibrate those with that. It's, it's been a problem for a long time that we have this differing values based on soil texture. We've had some really good advances though recently. And we're gonna, again, talk about that in a later date. Um, if we look at uh, generalized soil moisture release curve for a couple of different uh, uh, soils, um, we see water depletion in terms of inches per foot there on the y-axis and then the, the volumetric water content. And then on the bottom, we're looking at the soil water potential in, in cinnabars. Notice those are negative numbers. And then we've also got plant available water over here. So you can see the, the relationship there is, is, you know, if it's, if the soil is saturated, so in other words, I've got zero water depletion up here. You know, my, my curve is right there. I've, in this particular soil, that's about 13% water content, and I'm at about 100% plant available water. As we get dry, um, let's, let's go back here and look and see. So, um, so again, if I'm looking at a sandy loam soil, it, minus 40 centibars uh, is kind of the mark. So if we, if we kind of go right there, you can see that that 65 mark for plant available water, I just kind of come across here. So that's about nine and a half percent volumetric water content at 65 percent plant available water. And then that would be minus 40 centibars. And, and then I could keep going across here and say, well, I, I've lost about 0.35 inches in that foot of water. So that's kind of a helpful uh, set of data to, to, you know, to, to look at in terms of of this. And again, it has to be calibrated per different soil texture. Okay, um, now let, let's, let's look at a different way of doing this uh, using evapotranspiration. So we measure ET and then we replace it. It's really, it's, it's kind of a checkbook method. Uh, we get meteorological data with a, from a weather station. I, I can typically look that up. It's better if I have a weather station on site, like we have uh, several at BYU, we've got some in our research plots, for example, but, but I can usually look that up and get close. Um, I can look up the ET rates for Provo um, without having to own a weather system. Um, I need to know the crop growth stage and the crop coefficient, which we'll explain. The soil type, uh, in this case, the potato variety. And then also, you know, what's my irrigation system's capacity? How much can I put on? Uh, before the water starts running off, for example, or, you know, and, and, and how much can I put on in order to cover the whole, the whole area? Um, you know, sometimes that's an issue that I don't have enough capacity to uh, irrigate the whole thing in one day, uh, for example. So here's some typical ET rates. Um, this is Aberdeen, Idaho, uh, where, again, some of my, these potato examples are coming from. You can look at, you know, back here in, you know, in, in April, uh, these are sitting around, you know, less than 0.1 inches, inches per day. This is a per day basis here. Um, as, the, as the season goes and things warm up, we're climbing up here. We're getting as high as about, you know, about a third of an inch. And that's, that's fairly typical to be at, a, you know, kind of at a maximum at about a third of an inch. We rarely would go past that. Um, it's not too uncommon. I, I usually tell people somewhere between a quarter and a third of an inch. Uh, of ET per day in the hottest part of the summer. And that's pretty accurate. Uh, e even in the hottest places in the, in the Western United States, um, like I measured some in Arizona the other day and they, they were like 0.38 and that was like the hottest place in Arizona. So that's, that's kind of what we're, we're looking at for ET. All right, now, if we wanna look at the maximum irrigation interval and, and this is for um, you know, set move systems, uh, where I'm, I'm going to be looking at my, my interval. I'm going to take the plant available water. I'm going to multiply it by my root zone depth times by my MAD percentage, and then I'm going to divide it by the ET. That's the equation. So if we do use that, for example, uh, let's say I have a 24-inch root zone for this potato in a silt loam soil, and I looked up the, the, how much the water capacity that is. That's 2.2 inches per foot of plant available water with an ET of 0.33 inches per day. So if I knew all that information, I would plug all that into my equation and I would see that I'm, I'm 4.7 days between irrigations. Uh, if I go longer than that, I'm gonna run into serious stress and I don't wanna do that. 
So here's a nice little chart to use in terms of water holding capacity uh, in terms of inches per foot of soil. Again, a lot of my plants in the urban environment are, are rooting to a foot. That's pretty, that's a conservative number to use. Many of them are two feet uh, or more. I don't usually, frankly, I don't usually calculate it past that. Um, I usually just kind of stop at two feet when I'm doing calculations. If it's turf grass, it's probably more like, you know, four, six, eight inches. Uh, and we need to kind of get out there and figure it out. If I'm a really good manager, you know, I get six or eight inches root depth. Um, if I'm mowing really short and or not taking good care of my grass, I can be shallow. Um, you know, with really low mode turf, like on a golf green, it can be two inches. So it's important to figure that kind of stuff out when I'm, when I'm looking at these things. Now, this is still the wrong answer. <laughs> so sorry, uh, almost everyone makes the mistake of forgetting that irrigation interval clock does not start ticking until the time when the soil reaches the field capacity, which again, two to 24, 48 hours after the precipitation ceases. So if I have a, if I'm irrigating and I'm only irrigating to field capacity, then that calculation back here works. But if I, if I got a rain that filled the profile to saturation or I over irrigated and I filled it to saturation, then I've got another day. I mean, let's say it takes 24 hours to lose the gravitational water then I would actually add one day to this total. Um, again, it, it depends on whether I'm at field capacity or I'm at saturation. This equation is built on field capacity and I need to factor that, uh, that extra day in, uh, in most cases, if I, if, if I saturated, okay? So again, plants are taking up water during that 24 hour period, even though it's technically, uh, we haven't hit the plant available water stage yet. Okay, so assuming 24 hours, uh, you know, we're going to add a day, it's 5.7 days. All right, now also realize no irrigation system is perfect. Uh, this also has to be accounted for when we're doing irrigation scheduling. Um, irrigation systems are not perfectly efficient. Uh, we get all kinds of, of numbers out there. Some are really bad. Um, some are really good. Um, you, know, uh, you know, the very best I've usually measured is, is the high 70s. I rarely have seen in the 80s uh, that we're just not, it's really difficult to get perfect uniformity unless you're God giving precipitation, then you can potentially have a perfectly uniform application of water. But uh, when we're using man-made systems, they're not perfectly uniform. Um, so when we, also, so if I'm looking at, um, at uh, available soil moisture throughout the growing season for potatoes, again, under, under center pivot irrigation, for 100% moisture at the beginning of the peak use. If I look at this, um, uh, you know, here's my critical uh, available soil moisture. I just, I wanna keep it above that line. Um, if, if, if it was 90% at the beginning, uh, if, then, then I'm dropped below that. And so that, the, why that's a factor is that, you know, here's kind of a reality, is that at the beginning of the season when I start irrigating, I've got variability out there in my soils and my system and how much water I start off with. And so, you know, let's say I was assuming, you know, going back here, like, oh yeah, this is my average. Here I am, everything's good, but I got a part of the field that's dry. I've actually got into trouble, not in the whole field, but in these drier spots in the field. Uh, these spots here where, where it was drier when we started are in a little bit of trouble. So it's good to understand that we have variability, not just in the irrigation system, but also in soils and, and their moisture holding capacity and other things. Uh, there's a variety of things that affect uh, uh, this very factor. And so, so we need to kind of use our noggins and, and be able to figure those kinds of things out, know where the dry spots are in the landscape by walking around and checking and not just trusting you know, a calculator. Um, here's, here's distribution uniformity. And by the way, um, I'm not gonna show this, how to measure it, you can Google that just you know, how to measure irrigation uniformity. Usually when I do it, I take 16 uh, cups out there and I place them around various places in the landscape. And then we turn on the irrigation system and we collect them, we take all the measurements and then we, we drop them into a spreadsheet. And, and then we, there's a little calculation you use uh, that will give you these, these irrigation uniformities. So if, if we had a really high irrigation uniformity and it's, it's measured as, it's sometimes called DU or or CU. In this case, this is 
coefficient of uniformity, but in turf grass, we usually call it, or urban systems, we usually call it DU uh, for distribution uniformity. It's the same thing. Anyway, if I have 90% efficiency, um, you know, what we're looking at here is, is I've got this field and I've got differences out there because of my irrigation system. And you can see that if, I, if I'm 90% efficient, then I don't have nearly as much under irrigation or over irrigation. And, but the worse my system is, the more, you know, the more over and under irrigation I have. Every system has this. Um, so we have to kind of be aware of that and kind of, you know, try, try to manage that ac accordingly. Um, we, want to we want to do our very best to get those numbers as high as we can. And then we kind of have to irrigate to the driest spot in the landscape. Although that's getting better too, because we have great new technology that we're working with that's called valve in head technology that allows me to irrigate a dry spot. One, I can turn on one sprinkler head at a time instead of the whole zone. So we're getting better and better at this all the time. It's kind of cool, cool stuff. All right, so here's, here's the thing. This is, this is why this happens. Um, if you look at, you know, let's say, let's say my, my lawn is a square, you know, square lawn and I got a sprinkler head at every corner, all right? And, and my sprinkler heads are traveling in circles. So you can kind of see here that uh, we get some overlap. We get as much as four times overlap in some places, three times in others, and two times in others. So if we kind of just look at this area, um, you can see that uh, this, is, this coverage is four times. I got all four sprinklers hitting this area here. I got three sprinklers hitting this area here. But I got a little bit of area here that only two sprinklers are getting. Now, if the wind blows a little bit, um, it can kind of uh, even that out a little bit. So it's it's actually not quite as bad if I get a little bit of a little bit of wind movement there. I don't want a lot of wind, uh, but actually, wind is our a little bit of wind is our friend in this uh, this kind of scenario because it kind of helps give us a little uniformity. So you know, bottom line is these kind of illustrate what happens. I mean, if we get really, really wet spots, we can, we can get a lot of water moving down deeper. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna have some leaching here. I'm gonna leach water and, and nutrients and pesticides even, uh, because you know, this spot right here is gonna be kind of dry. And so if I have better uniformity, it's not perfect, but it's better. I get, I get better grass or whatever else I'm irrigating, potatoes, uh, trees, whatever I'm irrigating, I get better. Obviously, the, if I get really big root systems like trees, it's not as big of a deal. Uh, turf grass is a big deal because they got really tiny root systems. And so they tend to show it in spots, you know, these smaller diameter root systems show it more. So, okay, super interesting. Why poor uniformity? All kinds of reasons. You can see all this stuff here. Um, I'm not gonna go through all this, but there's, but we need to just kind of make sure we have a good system and that we, um, and that we fix leaks and broken heads and, and heads that are tipped over and all that kind of stuff. We need to get that fixed and keep on it all the time. Um, I think if you have a big property, you need somebody out there who's making sure you, you can pay a lot of dividends, get, get a lot of return on investment if you have somebody running around uh, fixing the irrigation system. Uh, here's just some examples of some sprinklers with broken heads and some other problems you see in the landscape with, with you know, spraying the house instead of the lawn. Um, you know, chart out where you're going to place your catch cans to measure your distribution uniformity. Uh, use a soil probe to measure rooting depth. Um, uh, I, I don't particularly like this probe. I like that uh, Mascaro soil profiler better. I think it's easier to see the root depth with that one, but, but you know, or use a shovel. Uh, so, you know, do you irrigate to the average or do you ensure the driest spot and the landscape's healthy? Typically, we're, we're doing the latter. All right, now, um, Let's look at uh, a couple, a few other things here. Um, so, so, so again, what, what's the root depth? What's the water holding capacity? Um, that can be affected by clay content or organic matter. So we need to uh, be careful there with those things. Um, we, we see this, again, this is a little bit different, a little more uh, a detail. So this is kind of a nice one. You can come back to someday and, and kind of look at it's, it's, it's loaded up. Uh, on Learning Suite for you. Um, we haven't talked about organic matter. Organic matter affects this too. The higher the organic matter, it's not just soil texture, it's organic matter as well. And so the higher the organic matter, the more water holding capacity I have. So that's another little 
thing that you know that, that that's a little nuanced that can mean you know the calculations aren't perfect. So and not a big deal. It's it's something we can adjust for. Um, in terms of uh, uh, again, uh, it's important to estimate those this water percent. Uh, that's important. Um, here's a table that I find helpful. You can, you can kind of look to here. Uh, again, um, this shows us in inches per inches. So inches of water per inch of soil, or it also shows in inches per foot. Uh, both of those are sometimes helpful to, to be able to have those numbers. Okay. Um, uh, here's again rules. That's the same one. Um, if you have a, a loam soil, you, for example, you would have about one inch of maximum allowable de depletable water if the root zone was one foot depth. If the root zone is six inches, uh, which is more realistic for turf grass, which again is the number one thing in our in our landscape, uh, this would only have a half inch of water. So that's important to realize, you know, shrubs versus uh, or, or whatever petunias, uh, you know, they're going to be a foot deep at least um, versus my turf grass. So that's important, and you know, and how we irrigate these. Now this does assume we get no, you know, I mean, we kind of want you to, to irrigate down to the bottom of the root zone. Um, this is kind of assuming that you don't get any wicking upwards. However, that's not true either. We do get some wicking upwards, but, but you know, not, not a ton. And so we, got, we don't want to, you know, if we push it down there a little bit, uh, plus you got to remember, you got that problem with uniformity, right? And so I usually just irrigate to the bottom of the root zone, knowing that some of my, some of my dry areas, I'm going to get a little wicking upwards. So, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of how I do it. All right, um, so what, you know, irrigation scheduling, here's, here's some things again, um, you know, how long does it take to go from saturation to field capacity? Uh, those are just the range there that we've talked about. Um, what is the ETA rate? Again, this is can, can be found uh, on local, you know, I can just Google that actually and see it really quickly. Um, typical rates peak at about 2.5, 0.25, excuse me. Uh, inches of water per day, and it can be zero on a cold day. So it's good, good to know that. Um, how many hours between irrigation events? Uh, you know, we need to figure that out. That's part of what we do. Here's a nice, uh, again, here's this calculation um, that it, it, a little bit different way to look at this. Um, but uh, I wanted to throw this up here uh, as well. Uh, because we run into this, this equation shows up in the literature as well, but I'm not going to run through it. Um, just wanted to introduce it. But remember, the clock isn't ticking during that time. Um, uh, remember, we got to account for saturation. So that's got to be part of our calculations when we're deciding how many hours between irrigations. Now, how do you know your soil texture? One way is to look it up on the NRCS uh, soil survey website. That's great. Maybe if you're a farmer, uh, even then it's not that accurate, to be honest with you. Uh, it's only an estimate. In the urban environment, it's usually not accurate because most of our soils are highly disturbed and or imported. You know, they're constructed soils. Uh, you can do, um, you take a sample and send it in to, the, uh, to a lab like the BYU Environmental Analytical Lab. You can also do texture by feel. Look up the NRCS website to see how to do that. If you took my soils class, we kind of went through how to do that. And, you know, that's usually good enough to at least get a starting point for you, okay? Um, texture by feel, um, again, this is, uh, this is kind of that from the NRCS website. I'm not gonna go through that, but, but just this, put this here for reference for you. Um, we're gonna talk about drainage more later. This is all important and, and is part of this. Uh, kind of one of the last things I wanted to mention here before I, I show you a calculator um, hydrophobicity is another thing that, that shows up for us. Um, hydrophobicity means the soil becomes water repellent. Uh, I, I like to call it armored soil. You can kind of see that picture here of this uh, soil, these beads here. They're just, the soil is just not taking the water. This is uh, called LDS, localized dry spot. Um, but, uh, you know, it kind of, it kind of can repel water. If it sits there long enough, it'll eventually absorb, but it's possible that it runs off. So that can cause some serious uniformity problems as well. It's particularly a problem in sandy soils on turf grass. Um, we, we really, you know, see this problem a lot with, with that scenario. Okay, so 
Um, let me just, one last thing here. If you go to um, Learning Suite and <clears throat> let's see, sorry, go under uh, content here and in class activities. And then we've got the spreadsheets section. There's a irrigation scheduling worksheet here. And I've already actually loaded that up for us. Here it is. Um, you, can, you can do this, uh, see the instructions for each one. I'm gonna actually make this a little bigger so you can see it a little bit easier. Um, so, and I've got it set up to do kind of two side-by-sides here. Uh, the gray cells are calculations, so we don't change those. You just, you put the input in the yellow cells and then it'll help you with the calculation. So let's say that uh, now, like with grass, you know, that's not gonna be 12 inches. So let's say my uh, rooting depth is eight inches. Um, I, I'm asking here how many hours to reach field capacity. Let's say it's a typical soil and it's 24 inches. Um, my total water holding capacity, I went and looked that up on those tables that I just gave you. And then it calculates uh, here my inches of water per inch of soil and my inches of water, uh, my total, excuse me, my total water in the rooting zone at field capacity, which is about one and a half inches uh, in that eight inch uh, profile. And then my approximate plant available water, which is half of it, is about three quarters of an inch. Now, KC, we haven't talked about that. Evapotranspiration, um, if you remember back to when you took this in soils, the equation for that is, is that the ET, evapotranspiration, equals the KC value times the pan evaporation. So pan evaporation is just what it says. It's, it's a pan sitting out on the cement or, you know, whatever. And, and how much water evaporates out of a pan. Um, now, water is going to escape more easily into the atmosphere out of an open body of water than it is from a soil system. The, the, the plants themselves, the soil itself, provide some level of resistance to the evaporation and the transpiration. So we get less. That's the bottom line. So for turf grass, for example, like Kentucky bluegrass, it's about 0.81. So in other words, it's about 80% of the, the pan evaporation. So I can put that in. And, and frankly, you can look those numbers up. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. If you don't know, I usually put in 0.81. Um, now, I'm going to have differences too on if it's in the if it's in the sun or or it's in the shade. I'm going to get some different pan evaporation numbers, and I can go measure that. I can take a pan of water out there and measure that. Um, and so I, that's going to calculate my ET. So in this case, in the sun, it's about a, a third of an inch per um, yeah, per day. Uh, in the shade, it's less. It's about a quarter of an inch per day. Now this is a you know very hot day in the in you know July. Now I can also put in my 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 plant available water. My my you know this is my mad water, right? Um, where my mad calculation comes from. So it's the percent at which we see that stress. So if I if it was potatoes, um, we would have sixty five. You know we'd do sixty five percent, and there would be thirty five calculated, right? Um, but for turf grass and most things in the urban landscape, it's the fifty fifty number. So then this tells me uh, how much water to add at irrigation. And then it tells me how many days between irrigations. It, it does all those calculations for me. So this is kind of a nice little thing. And then I can also run it side by side over, over here with another part of the landscape, like with a green. Um, you know, over here I've got, a, a, you know, I'm mowing it closer. So I'm, let's say I only have a two inch root depth. Um, and it only, because it's a sandy soil, it's only two inches per hour or excuse me, <laughs> two inches to reach uh, field capacity. Oh my goodness, I just am just goofing this up. Start over. Two hours between saturation and field capacity. Um, and then I get, uh, uh, so for this sand, I've got um, my total water holding capacity of that sand is, is only 1.2 inches of water per foot of soil, okay? So you can see the numbers here, the calculations that it does for me. Uh, the KC for this particular one's a little higher because it's closely mowed turf. 
Um, uh, we, we, we've got the same pan evaporations here. Um, we, we need it because it's, it's closely mowed turf. We've got a little higher number, uh, but you can see um, because it's so shallow rooted, I can only put on a tiny bit of water, which means I got to irrigate far more frequently with less water than this scenario over on the left. And, and, for, and, and in this case, I can only get 0.2 part of a day. <laughs> I, I, so, you know, that's not a good scenario, which is part of why we build perched water table systems, which we'll talk about later um, uh, in these greens, because we can't even get through a full day with that particular scenario. So um, that's, uh, so anyway, we can kind of play with these numbers and see how that works. Uh, I know that was a lot of information. Uh, we're going to be going over it more in class, but um, hopefully this is helpful and gives you the, the foundation you need for irrigation and being a good irrigator, which is frankly one of the most important things that we do in a landscape. Um, the water, you got to get it right. It's really important. Relatively speaking, it's more important than about anything else we do in the landscape. So thank you very much.